The Golden State Warriors are champions of the NBA after finishing off the Boston Celtics in six mostly boring games, except for the one where Steph Curry went crazy. Joining us now to talk about it, fresh off Father's Day, that Father's Day glow still around him, and it's wonderful to talk to him now while I'm not standing on the side of the road in New Mexico. He's my former colleague, one of the greatest to ever do it, ever. He's Dan Devine. Dan, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm well. I'm glad that the glow is still showing off of me. Yes. That it has. It, I, I've retained it after a couple of days because the first thing that happened to me on Father's Day was my four-year-old yes. looked looked at me as I walked out of the bedroom and just went and just held her nose like, "Yo, you stink." Oh man! And it's a <laughs> and it's a bad Damn. start to the morning. And I was like, even on this day, on my one day, it's a tough start. But. The season's over. I get to be like talking to y'all at a time where I've slept. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So thank you so much for having me back. I showered so I don't stink like that anymore. So it's good to go. <laughs> so, Let's rock. Let me ask this. Was that a legitimate critique or was she just, she was just roasting you for no apparent reason? Like, what was it? Well, I mean, listen, I, you know, you, <laughs> it's not really for me to say at that point, you know, yeah, like yeah. Uh, it, it, it did lead me to make some changes. I'm not going to sit here and say that I didn't address <laughs> the situation. Man, don't, don't, don't let a four-year-old mess up your soap routine. Kids don't know what stinks. Yeah. They don't Kids know. Kids don't what know, it know what stinks they're until they're like twenty. That's exactly yeah. right. She, I mean, she's she's flagrantly disrespectful. Uh, her, she stinks all the time, and I'm not here trying to like. You yeah. know. But anyway, that's not why you brought me here today to to to, uh, to annihilate after the fact both uh. myself and my four-year-old. So that's not why we're here today. Let me ask Shout you out this. to Let's Dr. Bronner here. while we're here. That's yeah. right. Mother. Yeah. Let's start here, Dan. As a hardcore sports journalist, That's hardcore, right. do you switch off after the finals or do you watch the parade also? I ask because um, any good any good championship parade is measured by the, uh, the risk of alcohol poisoning to the people involved. And I think it was pretty high watching the Warriors parade. Uh, we did see... Uh, Clay Thompson drop his championship ring on the ground. We did see him uh, run over a woman who was just standing there. Uh, we did see him slumped in his chair, wearing a captain's hat. Do you watch that or do you just go, I'm done. I've done my work. I'm thinking about free agency. I'm thinking about the draft and I'm looking forward as a hardcore journalist. What does Dan Devine do with the championship parade? Uh, well, I used to have to write about that, too. And it was like whatever viral moments from the parade was like I had to write 15 posts about that bullshit. So now I don't have but to do that But you're a hardcore anymore. journalist now. I am. I, I And I am. I'm, I'm tracking Clay through. It's like, you know how they have like the tiger tracker, like the dude who was like <laughs> yeah, on yeah, a tiger yeah. all the way through. It's like you're just watching Clay and it's like it's like a family circus cartoon, dotted lines, weaving in and out of stuff and maybe getting wet and falling down. I tuned in for just like just to see how much people were going to get to say, because there was that question of like, are the players going to get to actually talk and make statements? Because you want to hear from Draymond and you want to hear just how faded everybody is on a scale and yeah. establishing yeah. like a, like a, you know, sort of like a, a bandwidth of who's where. Um, but I, was, I mean, Clay wasn't game six Clay in game six. He was game six Clay at, at the parade. So that's right. like, you know, yeah. it was nice to see him make a comeback strong in that way. And uh, <laughs> you just hope that a, a lot of bystanders in the Bay Area are, are, are keeping their head on a swivel out there because it, it's real. It's real for him right now. Okay, I got a question. Let's, let me let me ask you some legacy stuff. I'm an NBA fan, yeah. which which means I can only enjoy something if I can compare it to some shit I saw when I was a child. And denigrated. The and denigrated in comparison. Yes, yes, yes. Denigrated Absolutely. in comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Warriors for chips. They've got an attitude. Is this the closest thing to the bad boys that we'll ever see? You think of – they Clay used to clothesline fools – Draymond is playing football during the basketball game. <laughs> Shout out to Zaza Pachulia. Just oh. you catching a stray just cuz. <laughs> My immediate thought is I watched those grit and grind Grizzlies teams and like Tony Allen literally savat kicked Chris Paul in the head. Like I saw that happen <laughs> in the paint. So if we're talking about like who, who's getting at who, Zach Randolph, Zach Randolph choke slammed Damn. Blake Griffin like he was Kane. I yeah, saw that happen. Yeah, crazy. okay, that's fair. That did happen. So, yeah, so, that did happen. So just in terms of sheer physicality, but in terms of accomplishment, those you know, those Grizzlies teams did not get there. So I kind of feel what you're saying from that. 
Um, the, but those bad boys teams, they went back to back, but they only won two, right? And then they weren't able to to kind of extend that. Um, and this is like, I mean, four in eight years with six finals trips in that time. And, you know, with, you know, the, the, the only real down period being when two of their three most important guys got hurt for extended periods of time. Like, this is pretty a pretty remarkable run. Like, you know, it, it, the serious answer to this is we haven't seen something like this extended in, the, in, in like a shorter period of time too. Like, it's not the Spurs four and 15 or whatever. This is four and eight. Like, that's, that's since the Bulls. We haven't seen that since the mid nineties. And um, if Steph is this, and if Clay is better next year than he is this year coming off another year removed from that injury and that rehab, and those young guys are able to sort of keep it, keep it cooking and, and, and develop, um, I don't know that we are necessarily done. Hey, that's fair. Now, I, I and I think a lot of hardcore NBA journalists looked at this series <laughs> like and you. thought, <laughs> like myself, hardcore. That's right. Like leathery, hard bitten. You know, I've got the pencil uh, stuck in my cap, and I've got the a little notepad in my uh, breast pocket. You're breaking down slob got, sets like you're watching eight millimeter. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's. Yeah, I got it's, the little. I'm just in there crushing tape, nonstop, right. nonstop, nonstop, and and that research brought me to the following conclusion. The Celtics look like the better team on paper. But the Warriors have that X factor of, you know, experience. They've been here before. They know how to win, et cetera. And then as it played out, it became clear that really the big thing, along with the experiences, the Celtics' best three players are turnover machines. And the team's one Achilles heel is turnovers because they are a great defensive team, right? Right. Uh, you're looking for any easy point you could get, and gratefully for the Warriors, the Celtics' three best players are going to give you those easy opportunities time and time and time again. How do the Celtics solve this problem? Because it's a structural problem, and it is one that really needs to be solved. I'm not saying they can't win a title as constructed, but you got to solve that problem. What do the Celtics do uh, going into 2022 and beyond? Well, yeah, I mean, the first thing is just, it's funny to have seen a Warriors finals where they're not the team that was throwing the ball over the fucking place, right? Yeah. Like like the, like the Warriors lost because Steph was throwing behind the back lefty passes in game seven, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, then yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it became like they were all of a sudden the mature, steady ones. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's, it's a function of the way they built. As you said, like, if you make Marcus Smart your point guard because you want to have that size in the backcourt and be able to switch everything, like... Be, it's the function of how their defense went from like really good to insane is part that's part of it it means that you're you're not going to have an elite table setter a guy who's going to make like the steady safe pass every time and who might be prone to just like a random six for 18 or six for 19 because he feels like he's got it going or he's going to shoot until he does and when you don't have somebody to like settle those possessions down it makes it really difficult to, to generate good offense. It, it makes it easier to get into the quicksand which we saw so much from them in the fourth quarters so one I mean it, easy is not really the word for it because they've constructed their team this way. But if you and, and now that you've given Smart the keys for a year and you know we're a 50 win team that will look like the best team in the NBA for most of the season, how do you take them back and go like actually no you're a two guard again um, and we're gonna play small with only you know with okay, and that was the other thing the construction was Robert Williams next to Al Horford or Grant Williams with it like always two bigs that made their defense so so you know just so tough to score against on the interior. How do you get all of those guys on the court while also increasing, improving the ball handling, improving the facilitating? It means like you need internal development from Tatum, from Brown, and from Smart. Smart's like 28 years old. Like if, I don't know that he's going to get dramatically better at ball security or ball handling. Brown and Tatum are young, but they've also like they've been in the league seven, eight years now. This is kind of who they are. Um, so the, I mean, the hope is that you like the, that margin. If you can just reduce that margin, if those guys get you know X percent better at just not fucking throwing it all over the place that then like you you reduce the vulnerability to that one big problem and if they do that maybe they win in six games because they that really was it i mean we all look for smart things to point at but like if they didn't throw the ball over the place they would have won the finals so do a little bit less of that and it's not really much as much about roster construction as much as about like you just can't do that as often i got two words for you gentlemen lethal dribbler they got to get with my guy, Lethal Dribbler, in the offseason. Start dribbling <laughs> bricks. Start dribbling bricks underwater, mm -hmm. and you will see the results. So you think uh, it's, not, it's not a Drew Hanlon solution? It's not, like, just uh, more time with him? It's my guy, Stu Hanlon. Drew, I, 
Stu Handling. AKA the lethal dribbler. You start you start with two terrines of stew and you just yeah. get underwater. Yeah, you just in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Ah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, first of all, I love Jalen Brown. I have an affinity for a guy with no spin move in his bag, constantly doing spin moves. As a, as a person who roots for Julius Randle, I love to see that. It makes me so it just it feels like home when I see that. Uh but you know, some people are going to look at this and say, well, you, you, you know, Mark is smart, 28. Uh, smart for Brogdon, Tyus Jones, you know, some kind of like, do we do we make a move there with either, do we pick one of the guys who isn't Jason Tatum and go in for a playmaker? Or is it, uh, do you see a move like that out there? Or are the Celtics going to say, no, these are our three guys. That's the culture of this team. And we're going to figure out how to improve around the margins and just be smarter with the ball and stop. If you, if your bag is empty, don't, don't go in there looking for a spin move because the spin move is not there. It's very aggressively not there. <laughs> We've established that if nothing else yeah. we learned over the course of the finals, I don't really think that's an option for them. I mean, yeah, like as, as much as it is, it would be wonderful to have a like, six to one assist to turnover ratio point guard like doing that takes away from the fundamental way they wanted to build the team which was huge defense right huge everywhere defense switch everything and like Brogdon is a guy who you know maybe he's certainly eminently gettable from the Pacers right now but like also gets injured all the time and plays 50 games and like isn't a better player than Marcus Smart right and you know someone like Tyus Jones that's a you know a, who's a guy who's like a like a four A player in baseball, right? Like he, where he's re, you know been like really good as a six uh, a sixth man, a backup point guard, but maybe not good enough to be your starter, and like really helpful in Memphis, but going to get a lot of money. It's a, figuring out how to make something like that work with that roster is really really tricky, and it's it, it just goes back to like I don't think Brad Stevens and Ime Udoka and whoever else is making decisions in Boston is looking at that and saying our problem is that we need to like dramatically dis or dismantle what worked and it, it's 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 the margin they got to get a little bit better at it but that said i mean if you if you get an option to like really upgrade with an elite level point guard and i don't know who that guy is that that would be there as a as a an available like significant upgrade who doesn't who's worth taking that step back defensively um, then maybe you do it, but and I would say as, as far as that, that that question of splitting up the Jays, if Jalen Brown got on the market, like twenty nine other teams would be instantly like, yes, we want that, like because I, the thing that I'll remember from outside of just how many broken possessions there were is that when it was Game Seven and they needed somebody, he was the only one getting buckets. He was the only one attacking the rim and trying to make something happen. And you combine that with the size, the defensive uh, work, and all that. Like that's a guy. If you get, if you're gonna get rid of him, you need like the mother load to get back. Take line is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy's Pick'em Game. Just pick over or under on your favorite or least favorite player stats, and you can win up to twenty times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it incredibly simple. That's their brand. That's what separates them from all the other daily fantasy sites. Is it's just easy. The NBA season is over, but the NHL finals continue this week with Game Four between the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Avalanche on Wednesday. How many points will Patrick Maroon rack up? How many goals will Andy Sorelli score? Sign up now with code TakeLine and you'll double your first deposit up to $100 in bonus cash. When you make your first deposit of $10 more, deposit $100, get an extra $100 for free. Sign up and play today. Woof, woof. I don't want to spend too much time on the guys that lost, but just yeah. a quick honorable mention to the worst player in Game 6, Derek White. <laughs> that man, oh, man was so afraid. It was like, you remember in the water boy when the dude gets picked in the onside yeah. kick? That was that was Derek White the entire game after playing so good early in the season. Are the Celtics going to move on from him? Get a new backup? I, no, I think I mean I think he's under contract for at least one more year after this. Yeah. I think ah. that that they are they're like going to say, "Well, we started to become awesome with that guy and like he was huge for most of the playoffs." I think what it is is that like Fred Van Vliet had the kid in the middle of the playoffs and his power up lasted through the end of the finals. Derek White's Kid based power up just ended a little early. Like, you know, the, the, you know, like the, the Super Mario star just like ended, it ran out a little bit early as he's trying to, he's trying to run over the spikes and it runs out a little early. The answer here is very clear stagger the birthday a, a little bit yeah. later, a little bit <laughs> later <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the conference finals, and then you're good money. That's fair. The salary 
weight of the Golden State Warriors, I think, has been a big, big point of contention. Uh, uh, Windy, the great, uh, the great wind horse over at ESPN, uh, caused a bit of a stir by mentioning, "Hey, you got to when you compete with the Warriors, you got to compete with their their checkbook as well as their players." Uh, notably, Andrew Wiggins, Maple Mamba, who uh, spent most of his career disappointing everyone and the and the entire nation of Canada. Uh, has uh, blossomed into a real impact, a real two-way impact player. I don't think that's, is that like controversial? Like that happened. We're like, yes, Andrew Wiggins is a champion now, but like everybody's acting like, the, oh, I saw it. I knew it. I knew he was going to be, no, you didn't. You didn't. No one did. This is what's great about it. None of us saw this. So Andrew Wiggins had, was an incredible player. Like if this was 2015, uh, they'd probably give him the finals MVP over Steph Curry. Uh, uh, Jordan Poole has emerged uh, as a real impact player off the bench and as a, as a spot starter when Steph Curry needs to be on the bench. And, of course, the Warriors are carrying a, a salary that is inching towards half a billion dollars. So, it, you know, when you put all the taxes and everything into it. Uh, what do we do here? Uh, you mentioned the Spurs earlier, four over 14, 15 years. Part of how they were able to do that was bringing in players over time, you know, like like Ginobili, who then emerged as as a key contributor to that team, finding all the right pieces to fit around Tim Duncan as the as the core began to age. I think you could make the argument now that you know maybe the worst contracts that the Warriors have are, are Clay Thompson and Draymond Green, right? So so what what happens with these? What happens with Andrew Wiggins? What happens with Jordan Poole? What happens with with James Wiseman, the number two pick who they didn't even need? I think the most important number here in all of this is uh, one point five billion, and that's what Joe Lacob's net worth is as of right now on Forbes. Right. Um, pay up. That's the answer. Pay the up. answer is you yeah. pay up, like because that also the Chase Center is basically a, a, like an ATM for him yeah, and for that I franchise. Know. Like that was yeah. why it's why they moved to San Francisco. It's why they were like you know a, a, the idea of, of whatever gate uh, additional like fifteen million dollars or something like that in gate revenue for every home game they have in the playoffs. It's it's a slot machine. It, it just it pays out. And so the thing that like it's. You know, Steph does not get like vocal about I want you to do this or I want you to do that. Like the power plays out publicly, like some of the other stars of his of his era. But when he took that supermax last summer, the extension, and it was like the 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 implication behind all that was we're done fucking around. Like we are like we like, I I now have my uh, kind of like commitment from the organization that they are going to spend to keep it together. And now maybe that's not every single you know player down the fifteen man roster, but like. If there's a question of what do you you know pony up for pool and restricted free agency, doesn't matter. Pay it, preserve the asset because now you know the salary slot like it was with the D'Angelo like uh, KD to D'Angelo Russell to Wiggins. The salary slot matters because that's how you add the talent when you're over the uh, over the tax line. You just need to be able to continue filling in that uh, that salary slot. Um, you know Looney deserve you know yes pay that man Gary Payton the, Gary Payton the second the vibes of letting him go right now pay that man like. And then the the hope or the the belief is, uh, eventually you know you're, you're I mean it's not that any one of those young players that the Warriors have is going to turn into Kawhi or whatever but like it's that guy those that core of guys uh, you know Jonathan Kuminga James Wiseman Moses Moody those young dudes will be able to then like be your sixth seventh eighth guys and that's where you where you save the money instead of paying like Otto Porter two point five million dollars that turns into eighteen with tax bills. Get you pay him out of here. Get Otto <laughs> Porter. <laughs> oh, vacate got, Otto got, Porter's got, title. We got right oh, now. Okay. We got to talk about this. I do because, need to hear this. Listen, as as a Knicks listen, as a Knicks fan, uh, a feeling that I am uh, quite used to is watching players who the Knicks cast off, uh, watching them perform and impact a team in the, another team in the postseason and deep into the postseason. Jamel, of course, is a Wizards fan. Mm -hmm. So, Jamel, you're imagine a, imagine the pain of watching Otto Porter Jr. Win a, win a fucking ring! He would have, Otto Porter would have ring! Jamel, you're, the, the beef here is with the Brooklyn Nets <laughs> who signed, or it was the Sacramento Kings, right? The Kings signed him to that office. Yeah, yeah it was with the yeah. Kings. It was the Kings. So you, as always, it's it's fuck the kings. It's get at it's get at Vivek. That's the that's the issue here. The issue is with myself. Okay, I, know, I, I feel you. myself because I wanted him to stay. I was like, keep him. I saw him become 
a really good three-point shooter. And all mm-hmm. he was able to do was shoot threes in this final. And he actually hit them. Oh, it was disgusting to watch. Ugh. Now, the real the, the people who are really hurting on this is, like, the Bulls made a big move for him and were like, Otto Porter might be, like, the third piece of our rebuild. Ridiculous. And then it's, like, absolutely, like, uh, you know, Tin Man broke down for two years, and then that now winds up being, you know, the missing piece small ball four on the championship team. I Difficult. hate that he was the perfect, the missing piece on a championship team. I hate that I had to watch it. <laughs> uh, what the Wizards really need is another power forward. They got Chris Ups, they got Rui, they got oh, yeah. uh, Avia. Uh, they really, they really, really, really need one more. Jason, four. we're reinventing basketball. <laughs> um, That's not a reinvention, by the way. By the way, the, the Knicks tried the all five power forwards lineup, and it didn't work so hot. <laughs> um, finally, one more legacy question. Throughout the run up to this finals win, the Warriors, from top to bottom, I'm talking like. Lakeup on down to anyone associated with this crew has been very, very loudly working, laying the track to separate this finals win from their previous finals wins, uh, specifically the finals that they won with Kevin Durant. It's been it's been a point of discussion. Oh, this is the greatest one we ever did. This is the most special one. Uh, You know, this was always Steph's team. Always, throughout everything, you know, I'm, I'm not denigrating anybody, but it was always Steph's team. Uh, those kinds of, of comments. How do you view this in the context of the Warriors run? And of course, the run is ongoing. How do you look at this? And what do you make of those, <laughs> those not really subtle attempts to, to, to distance this Warriors team from the Warriors team uh, with Kevin Durant? It's like there is a classic... Uh you know, post breakup behavior to it. Like, listen, I like, I, 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 whatever happy I was with you, I can be that happy without you. Like I, I, I'm the one that was the get, I'm the one that was the catch, not you. Three years later, maybe it's like, well, you don't have to be so loud about that. Like you can just kind of live your own life comfortably and everybody's moved on pretty well. But I think in terms of, of what the title was like, I, that was the thing I kind of, like, it struck me watching the finals. Everybody had talked about, you know they need to turn the Warriors need to turn all those young guys or all those whatever contracts and assets into a third another superstar, right? Whether that was Bradley Beal or whoever, like that needs to be another superstar. And it's because the KD era broke our brains. Like the the, the fifteen Warriors were a really good team that had flaws, and every other team in NBA history basically that wins a championship was like a really good team that wasn't invincible. And then the Warriors kind of fucked up the game and they broke the, they broke our brains for the way we understand what a champion needs to look like. So then this year, it's like, no, yeah, there's a bunch of really good teams that all have flaws. So then you figure out matchups and styles, make fights and whatever. So I think for them to look at it and say, yeah, we can still win this way. Like this was, we never couldn't win this way. Even when KD got hurt against the Rockets in, that, uh, in uh, the 2019 final of uh, playoffs, we still closed them out that way. And we won, you know, we kept going. We would have won a championship maybe if not for Clay going down. Like we felt, they always felt this could work. So I get why they look at it like this is proof of concept, even if it didn't really need one. And the emotional contingent, like Steph breaking down crying on the court because like they were a 15 and 50 team that went all the way down to the bottom. I understand why this is more sort of special in the moment after the fact, but it's like, they're they're recognizing and saying out loud too, like, yeah, we understand that what we did there and what happened there was like a break from history, and this is what it. But this is what works, and this is what can work for us, and this is why we're special. We make us special, not whatever we brought in from outside. Doesn't change the fact that you went and started calling from out, like from the parking lot after you lost to LeBron to go get what was outside yeah. to bring it in to make you special again, oh. but. We always, we always. By the way, that's the part of the story that always gets brushed past. That they were recruiting Katie. I mean, they were calling him, wanted him to come, pitching him on joining the team. We always forget that, but we don't want to talk about that part of it. But I digress. Just, just gonna say they're the Hamptons Five because they all went to the Hamptons to fucking ask Katie to come. No, I just wanted to say that uh, after everything. Uh, this just makes the 2016 final that much better. It's still game seven of 2016 is still the best game I ever watched. Right. And every year after it, it gets better. 
Well, I think that's the way to look at all of this, right? Like, th- what ha- what just happened? I mean, I guess unless you're a Celtics fan, in which case, you know, yeah. we're playing the world's smallest violins for you. But um, like, <laughs> this this enriches everything before. It validates the early, the early championships and that, that 73 win team. It makes the 2016 finals and the Cavs coming back even more insane and incredible. It makes what we saw during those KD years, like, it preserves it in amber as something that's like we're never going to see a team like that again and then it also it elevates everybody who's left with the warriors now steph clay draymond everybody it it elevates all those guys legacies after the fact like it's not often that everybody comes away a winner i guess again maybe except for boston and kd but like everybody comes away a winner in this situation and we got to watch some pretty cool basketball along the way dan devine uh it's been wonderful having you here I just want to note also uh, the Game 7 uh, 2016. We got Game 7 2016 and then Game of Thrones Battle of the Bastards later that evening. What a Sunday of <laughs> fucking better and better content and, better. and television that was. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dan, it's been wonderful to see you. It's been wonderful to talk with you. Uh, I love it. I love having you on. Please come back. Oh, I'm was, begging you. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, Jamel, wonderful to see you as well. Uh, and I hope our legacies are only burnished by this this discussion. Yes. Amen. That's the, that is the hope.